Hello and welcome to the Life Magnetics podcast or to my YouTube channel, depending on where you're consuming this content. My name is Crystal Ann Compton and I am so excited to be with you today. Please forgive my voice, my stuffiness. I got very sick this week, honey. I was struggling. I thought I had the COVID. I thought I had the COVID, but I don't have the COVID. I just got sick, but I'm starting to clear it. And I'm glad I didn't cancel my interview today with Jally because what an interesting person she is. She's a clairvoyant healer. And in this episode, she talks about a lot of different things. But one of the things that I really keyed on was her energy healing process. Because what she does is clairvoyantly, she's able to see where misalignments exist within a person. And then she removes misalignments, which she calls pictures, and then brings in new pictures or other pictures, which I guess come from the Akashic records. And she replaces old pictures with new pictures. And somebody experiences a total energetic healing. It was just fascinating to me. And I know the kind of people who follow my podcast or who watch my YouTube. I know this is the kind of person that you're going to be really, really interested in. Please, before we get into this conversation, make sure that you are liking, commenting, following, subscribing, reviewing, and doing whatever you can to support the podcast or the channel. It really does help me grow this community. Okay, without further ado, let's get into today's conscious conversation with Jolly Vicella. Jolly Vasella is a clairvoyant master healer and mindful energy coach. Using cognitive behavioral therapy, mindfulness, compassion, and clairvoyant studies, Jolly helps personal development enthusiasts discover their intuition and improve mental health through energy and mindfulness tools. Welcome to the podcast. I'm so happy to have you. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so happy to be here with you, Crystal. Yes, yes, yes. Um, before we get into this very interesting work that you do, I thought we would start with just your background. And um, I love to hear stories about how people had a spiritual awakening or came into the work that they now do. So why don't you tell us about your background and how you got here doing this beautiful work? So there, there's so many points that actually brought me to this. Um, the first ones were when I was a kid. So my family uh, does have a bit of a herbal and psychic background. Uh, no one really told me about it properly until later on. But I heard things my dad said or my aunt said. Um, and that kind of stayed with me. And then I uh, blocked it out because my dad died. And I turned into the analytical me to not process my emotions, <laughs> which most humans like to do. Um, so that was kind of the first bit um, until I was 10 years old. Then when I was 12, my mom sent me onto this yoga camp. And um, I met this yogi I really resonated with. By then, I was a gang kid. <laughs> oh, well, I think I was 13. I smoked weed. And I, I didn't think there was anything healthy about life. It was any, anyhow beneficial. And this guy... Um, through no lecturing brought me into awareness that I didn't really want to be harming the environment or my body. Um, it felt all of a sudden that I didn't want to eat meat. I had spurs of life when I uh, had eaten more or less meat. So this was when I was 13. Uh, then when I was 18, I started study studying uh, more seriously psychology. I had studied before. So there was also a moment of me realizing I need to help people. Uh, so that they don't commit suicide like my dad and then in my mid-20s um, I decided to go and study first meditation breath work and then mindfulness and there was another moment when I realized okay uh, this is a point that's opening another dimension for me and I like to compare the new dimensions of things we are not able to realize that we can realize uh, things behind a corner or so and all of a sudden I saw behind the next corner <laughs> and that this was in my mid-20s when I started meditating and studying mindfulness and then let me see when I was four years five years later uh, I started doing pranic study so there was another dimension I was like wow okay this is what my dad talked about <laughs> healing with hands and stuff 
Um, and then the beyond, I couldn't understand. Uh, so there was a moment when he manifested schizophrenia, uh, when he had episodes and he was running around the flat. It was, I think it was just one or two times. And it was almost like he was talking from a different dimension, trying to translate a language. And I kind of understood this when I started studying the clairvoyant studies. So this is um, seven years ago. So yeah, these were the bits. <laughs> so your father started speaking in what sounded like a different language and is, uh, for, or, so metaphorically not, from another not, dimension, like he was channeling something, do you think? Yeah, it, it did sound like he was channeling something that he was, um, let me see, because I'm actually now studying as well after all those studies I've done uh, and uh, kind of merged together into uh, the coaching and healing practice. Because uh, I'm a nerd, I started studying transmedium studies as well, where you go actually learning how to channel healthily and properly. And let me see from this perspective, if that's what he was doing. Um, yeah, in the unhealthy way, though, in the untrained way. Yeah, that's what he was doing. Okay, so when you say from an unhealthy perspective, I've been in the presence of someone who was channeling, but an, an earthbound type of an energy, maybe a lower dimensional astral energy, that was kind of an attachment. So speaking from the attachments perspective. So when you say that perhaps he was speaking from an unhealthy, uh, through unhealthy channeling, what do you what do you mean by that? Do you think? That's a great question. So there are lots of people who um, are able to channel because um, of them having been high vibrating beings uh, before they entered their body this time. Uh, and for whatever lessons they were supposed to take, whatever soul contracts, whatever kind of um, deliverables <laughs> they're supposed to have here on earth, um, they didn't end up being aware of uh, their energy, being aware of uh, the source they are connected to. Um, and with that, they are able to channel. So they're able to get uh, the messages from other beings, but either they're not really aware it is what it is, which can manifest as schizophrenia, or they're aware of what it is, uh, but they haven't got used to and worked with their human body yet, which means they have not really grounded into their body. They don't have a functional grounding practice. They may not have a mindfulness practice staying in the moment. Um, and they do not connect to the higher vibrations. It could be one or those, a combination of these when people do not channel in a healthy way. And that can mean they go channeling low vibrating beings. They don't really have proper energy protection. So they're affected by that. And it can really mess with their mind and the body. And it, it doesn't really have to be beneficial for whatever or whoever is listening to them or working with them. Yes, I um, had a very good friend who opened to channeling, but in an improper way, and didn't hadn't really dealt with the fear that existed inside of herself. She had some just inherent fear to the world of spirit that she hadn't worked on first. And in activating the channeling, she attracted um, attachments that began to convince her that they were supreme, that she must follow them only that she was the mouthpiece, that she was very special on the, like she really went down this path and she didn't have the infrastructure to understand that you can really tell the difference between a high vibrational being or an angel, if you wish, or ancestor, a Jesus Christ consciousness energy and a lower vibrational being. And so because she didn't have the, the capacity, the resources and the infrastructure she spent, she almost committed herself. She was just out of her mind and in a state of profound fear. So that can happen. People really need to understand um, how to recognize these different energies. You know, Jesus said, you will know them by their fruit, which to me is by their vibration of love or light or proximity to source. So very interesting. Um, let me ask you, because I'm, I'm keying in on the fact that you're a clairvoyant master healer and clairvoyance, I'm clairvoyant as well. This is something that I've always had as a child. I remember seeing things all the time. Um, when did your clairvoyance come online? Did it come online when you started to meditate or is this something that's been with you all the time? And how did you turn this into healing as well? How does this adapt into healing for you? Those are great questions. Um, so I like to um, let people know that everybody is able to be clairvoyant. We just don't really work with it. We, we have it when we are born. 
uh, and then we lose it as we don't work with intuition uh, around age um, 12. Um, I wasn't aware I was clairvoyant until I started working with clairvoyance for me. <laughs> so I was, uh, and I did say this um, on another podcast. Uh, and it's funny when I do these talks, I kind of realize things I don't, know, don't normally talk about. And there were moments uh, during my life when I was a kid, when I would be, well, we don't really like saying foretelling future in energy because energy changes, but I did see things that would be happening. So it was office buildings being built opposite my mom's house. It was um, kind of these messages of what the next stop is on buses that didn't exist back then. Um, it was the president is going to be next. I actually hated the idea of that, but I knew that was going to be him. Um, uh, things like that. So, so that was the clairvoyance we like from the popular sense. I did see those things. Um, I saw my classmates, who they would become, how they would look, what kind of energy they would be carrying, how their faces would be changing. Um, and then I would see um, things I thought everybody saw. Uh, and then I realized people don't. <laughs> like colors of energy around places, around people. And that is the voice, that is, that is the real seeing. So I have loads of clear cognizance and knowing, so knowing this is going to happen. And then I saw stuff. And then I had bits with uh, beings without bodies, with ghosts who would be entering my room and moving stuff. And my mom telling me that that's not happening. <laughs> my mom was the, was the analytical one, even though she's really enjoying life and mindful from the human perspective, the energy world is something I've been reopening for her, not her to me. So, yeah, so that was with me uh, and I kind of, um, yeah, stopped myself from seeing that being with it because you, to be able to use the gifts, ideally, you need to process your emotions as well, which your friend didn't do. And I yes. hadn't done until my mid twenties. I hadn't processed my father's death. And so I didn't really have the access to the gifts in a healthy way anyway. So it was good. I <laughs> did not work with it. Uh, I just knew there was something there. And then in my uh, early 30s, when I started opening up to it fully, I realized, oh my God, I've always had this and I never used the gifts. And it's just not the fun gifts of some telling someone, okay, like, you know, this boyfriend is good for you. You will get a new, or oh, it's not good for you. Get a new one in two years. It's the real upper hand in knowing and being able to manifest that, being able to navigate life much easier when you actually use the gifts. So yeah, that's kind of shame, but I wasn't ready for that. <laughs> And so um, how does your clairvoyance factor into the healing work that you do? And can you talk about the healing work as well? So the healing work I do comes from uh, the logic that we can't just see energy. We can't just feel energy. We also need to heal the alignment of our body, mind, and us being energy beings. Because when we descend into the body, we have this strange contradiction of us wanting to be here, but not wanting to be here at the same time. <laughs> Going like, okay, this is fun. That's fun to be in a body but it's heavy and it has these pains and those emotions and all that creates traumas it creates mental issues fatigues tiredness feverishness trying to escape the moment not enjoying the human life and when that isn't listened to when that isn't aligned it develops into either mental issues physical issues so my understanding of this me having experienced it secondhand with my dad and then firsthand with me with reaction of you know processing um has brought me to okay so i can actually use my clairvoyance into guiding people to see their misalignments and so that's kind of the first thing I do in coaching and depending how long people stay with me or uh, doing my courses, they learn how to heal themselves as well, either themselves or others. So when you sit with a client, um, you can see with your psychic vision where the misalignments are, like what are some common misalignments that people have? Correct. Okay. So let me have a look. So I've had a bunch of clients today, uh, slightly more than usual because of uh, some time off I had. Um, so the really common ones uh, are often in, so I go through the chakric channel first. That, that's what I've been guided to do first. 
Um, and depending on how advanced a person is in their awareness, uh, in the body may let me go further uh, beyond the body, uh, onto the aura and the energy field, or maybe even into how they connect into the world. And if they're really aware, I may see where else they're connected to in, say, dimensions or other worlds. Uh, so I start with the chakras and the most often um, blocked ones are the throat chakra, often in women who have a program of being a good girl, <laughs> not being able to say what they need when they need it. Uh, there was one today I had uh, that, yes, that had been in a relationship, uh, one of those strange ones that you know, you think you know you're staying with this person and all of a sudden he's gone. Um and so as a result of that, there's a block in her throat chakra thinking, okay, if she's not going to say everything next time, then maybe the guy doesn't run away. Right. <laughs> Which, you know, that doesn't really make sense, but there's the program that was there. Um, the other chakra that is often misaligned is solar plexus, the chakra in our stomach that goes dealing with stress. And there was a really heavily overloaded a lady I had yesterday whose solar plexus was squished. So I see in uh, the uh, clairvoyant session I have that combined with coaching and start with looking at the person, I see what a chakra is doing. And it was like surge size. Um, and it didn't really have its own energy. We often have other people's energy in the body and that's always unbeneficial. And depending on how aware, how basically easily vibrating high the people are, the moment I start looking at the area, they go changing back to what they should be. So the more advanced uh, they are to say, the easier it is to bring them back to, mm -hmm. to the head. A bit so so these two guys um and then often the first because our first chakra is survival housing um the whole fear of uh, being able to uh, be in this world and stand uh here and <laughs> yeah and then we'll be here till the end of the days so that one is uh really blocked often as well probably yes. no that makes sense um what a crazy time in which we live you know i mean this is an interesting time but it makes perfect sense for the soul to incarnate now because this is a time of such transition. We stand at the precipice of so much change, whether that's culturally, you know, socially, whether this is technology, artificial intelligence, and there's so much potential for good and also for the opposite of that. And I think we did incarnate for such a time as this to be here now to hold the light and to help the shift. But people need to be aware of their innate and infinite power and to me and tell me if you agree i find so many people just in various stages of disempowerment like not really understanding who they are and what they can do and you're speaking about being able to see somebody's energetic misalignments i would say most people don't even know that they're actually intuitive you know that they could actually pick that up intuitively within themselves um do you think everyone's intuitive? And if so, for someone listening who's like, well, I don't see anything, I don't feel anything, I don't hear anything, how could somebody connect with their own intuition and turn it on? So those are three questions you've brought up there. So let me see if I can... <laughs> <laughs> can answer them all uh, um, before forgetting <laughs> what they were. So the first one was, uh, do people know uh, that they are actually energy beings, right? That uh, are people aware of that? So most people are not aware of that. Most most people don't have the luck to uh, have been brought to the knowing. And that's part of their soul contract. It's part of their soul contract to be in the unknowingness and to experience the world this time from that perspective for one reason or another. Now, when they do get, uh, I like to say, the upper hand of knowing that they are energy beings uh, then as i said they're able to navigate their life way more and i like to think those are the happy successful people not not the successful people who have houses and money but those people who walk around their life happily and are able to turn things into something beautiful uh with uh, yes a snap of fingers um and the last one was if you think everybody is intuitive um well, everybody was intuitive to mm -hmm. have come into this world. And because of most of the programming we have as children, well, we aren't really told how to be intuitive, right? We are told how to at least 
and that's why I'm so observing with my clients and their kids. Now, for me, it's been years since I was um, at primary school. I don't have kids myself, but there still isn't any studies besides the analytical part. Probably the closest we can get to something that would be tuning into your intuition are schools with meditation in India or art that we get to work with, maybe some more alternative art where we don't really go drawing anything concrete because this goes, goes processing our traumas and connecting us to intuition as well. But other than that, we go losing it and we need to be reminded of it at the right stage of our life to be able to accept that it's there. Is there anything that somebody could do to start like to open their third eye or just to, to activate their intuition? Yes, there was the other question I didn't get to think. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, totally. So first, uh, you need to start believing that you are intuitive. Mm. Um, it really helps to realize the difference between the analyzing mind and the intuitive mind. Those are those two that go kind of fighting and the analytical in most of our, our cultures goes overpowering everything else and not to our benefit because you can't really calculate life beyond certain Excel sheets. Um, and let me think, uh, navigating <laughs> your route somewhere. Um, you really can benefit way more from being intuitive. So if you go thinking how many times a day you're actually analyzing, I'm not sure sure what it is uh, for the particular listener, your calories, budget, sleeping hours, um, how much money you have, you will have, how many people you have to see, that is you analyzing, that is you trying to figure out your life from the perspective of calculating, basically. Now, intuition, on the other hand, and it doesn't mean that you go just using one or the other, but you can use way more your intuition and uh, analysis uh, less so that it's beneficial. Intuition, on the other hand, is knowing that you need to see this person, knowing that you will make this money, knowing that this food is good for you and that food is not going to be beneficial for you, knowing that this time is good for you to go to sleep, but this many hours is good for you to sleep, and this time is good for you to wake up. Well, such life is way easier, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So realizing that th this is where you are and maybe acknowledging uh, that your mind is doing this and that, this analysis, without criticism, please surrender to the fact, be amused <laughs> that your mind does that. That's the program you got. Uh, and it's good for something. Start with you being able to distinguish analysis, intuition. And then go ahead and tell your mind, okay, so I'm opening up to intuition. And you can start with saying, Simple things, perhaps. Maybe in the shop, asking your intuition, and it'll be really weird at first. Hey, what is the first that I should be buying today? Don't go with the usual list. Don't go with the, I don't know what you have, tomatoes, apples, uh, oranges. Go ahead and look at the fruit, which means you need to be in a store where you see produce if you don't just shop online. And let yourself be drawn to the produce. Or maybe pick up the produce and feel how you feel. Now, you don't need to be going all crazy, dancing around the shop and feeling if the orange feels really good or not. Just millisecond of you feeling it, like Marie Kondo goes saying with the items, you should feel joy when you pick it up. <laughs> so that's your intuition telling you your orange is good for you. So you can start with that. And then you can go maybe with the people you're supposed to see and you don't have to see and go, okay, do you feel joy deciding if you should go or shouldn't go? Do you feel joy if you are going to this meeting or that meeting? Be amused if you don't have any choice anyway. So that's how you can start. And then there are beautiful exercises. I actually do have uh, a freebie for on my link tree slash Jolly Solutions. There is DJ Ali Together and Solutions uh, for how to feel intuition in your body. And you can actually tune into your chakras every day and realize that they are there and how they feel today. And with this, you're doing a mini energy clearing, which is one of my forte, something dozens and dozens of people come uh, for groups into. Um, so that's your inner intuition, kind of tuning into what's in your body. And let's step away from knowing, okay, so where is um, the sickness? Where is something I need to heal? Uh, where is extra rest needed? Why do I have this knot in my muscles? Hmm. 
Okay. I love that. <laughs> and well, the thing that's so great about that is that it's simple and it really does just require you to have an intention and then to ask. And it's amazing. I do think it's a universal principle. When we ask, we will receive every single time. The answer is there. You just have to listen for it. Um, let's talk a little bit about fear, because I think when people start to get into spirituality, metaphysics, and they want to do, they want to be clairvoyant, they want to be intuitive, they also sometimes naturally think about the worst that could happen. Well, if I open up, what if I'm attacked by a demon? Or if I open up, what if I go too far and I can't get back? What do you have to say about fear and how somebody can overcome it? Oh, I love that. That's such a great question. Because one of the reasons why people don't start, I almost want to say soon enough, <laughs> with intuition and with energy work, with healing, self-healing, is because they're afraid uh, how they would feel if it wouldn't take up too much of their space, time, wouldn't transform their social lives too much, if their families would recognize them. Um, so, um, yeah, basically they go um, being afraid of what they become. There is this beautiful, almost, uh, I would say, mainstream um, documentary by now. What the bleep do we know? Have you seen that? Yes, I have. Yeah. And there is this little bit uh, from, oh, what, is, what is the guy called? The Professor Proton. He's something else. He's like a scientist that has a cartoon. Mm hmm and he's showing you the 2D life uh, into 3D life. Uh, and he goes kind of illustrating, if you were 2D, would you know what a 3D feels like? Well, you wouldn't, and you would be pretty afraid of that. So that's pretty much where the fear comes from. It's like, what do I become? And there is this little extract there from that where yeah, there's this being and he goes showing her what she would become and she goes oh my god but yeah but, but what do I do now <laughs> and, and that's true because sometimes when I think about right now before our taping I was doing new year energy energy clearing session and what came to me as the guidance as I prepare for it for three days was show the people that they can't imagine what they can't imagine you can't imagine <laughs> what you would become. And it's a scary thing. But at the same time, it's an exciting thing. Because if you look back, oh my God, when I, when I look back, I could never imagine I would live in the place I do. I would know the wonderful people I have. I would learn all the languages, all the knowledge I have. Just because we can't really imagine what we can't imagine. So the fear is natural it's kind of our primal survival and again we want to be aware of that and go okay be amused by that that is the original monkey that doesn't want to leave the cave so that they are safe but hey when they do well there is a forest and maybe a waterfall after the forest there may be a valley and they may see a sky full of stars and they may recognize the constellations with stargazing and then they go go bird watching and i can just go on with how we can discover the dimensions so again like with the previous uh guidance that you gave us well let's ask to acknowledge the fear and then just be amused by it and go beyond it let's see what's after let's not sit in the fear that's can sometimes be a little easier said than done um Yes. You know, but I mean, but I, I do think that it requires bravery and a willingness to step forward and an understanding of who you are, because I believe that the consciousness having the experience is the consciousness in control of the experience. And I often talk about something that I've labeled dominion, which is when we fall into alignment with who it is that we really are as divine beings, there is an inherent power in this. Like, really, when I first left the church, I was a Christian, and I started exploring metaphysics, Edgar Cayce, all of the different ideas, and I started going back to my psychic self, I was routinely attacked in the world of spirit, shadow people, beings, you could call demons, I don't think, they, I think they were earthbound spirits, but it was because I didn't know who I was. But after many years study meditation prayer, I realized, oh, when Jesus said you are all gods, I get it. I am a godlike being. And when you stand in the energy of that, the entire world of spirit recognizes 
and falls into place around that around that so i think with fear it is being willing to take that unknown step and also knowing who it is that's taking the step because no weapon formed against you shall prosper and that's just what it is and if you believe that it's true I agree totally. I think it's the willingness to take the unknown step. And I think where you need to start with just that one step. What I see often with, so say I have clients now in South America, thanks to me speaking Spanish, people having asked me to do interviews in Spanish. There's a whole world in a dimension. That's one of those I couldn't imagine opened up for me. I never imagined I would be working in Spanish. Now, uh, with some of the people in Latin America compared to where I live in Europe and the American clients I have, they are poor and they can't imagine what a step would be out or the whole process of, of them having more financial abundance. So what you start with is one step. So I had a client today who is clairvoyant naturally, but she's never worked with it. And I've seen beautiful visions for her of her helping other women. Uh, so I said, just make the first step, whatever comes to you. If it's uh, Instagram, if it's website, if it's a uh, little drawing, whatever it is. And then you take the next step after, because we worry about what is after, what is after, what is after, and get into this whole anxious mind that goes locking us in place and not letting us go further. So just yeah, go ahead and be amused that the fear has come and imagine, okay, well, what it is, is going to be good. Because often what I see with some clients who have been too long in the fear, unfortunately i don't get too many but it could be jobs or relationships often they don't want to step out of those because they're afraid what about what is if it's going to be worse when i step out well what if it's going to be better how much mm -hmm. worse can you get than a job that you hate going to a partner that you don't have sex with or it doesn't listen to you how much worse can this get so right. what if yeah, we get amused by, okay, this is the fear. Let's, let me make the first step. And it doesn't have to be changing the whole job, maybe not leaving the partner straight away. But just maybe. one little small step brings the momentum and carries yeah. you forward. Yes. Yeah. And, and it, start, it starts with the intention and decision to take the step in the first place. And we can all do that, right? Correct. Yeah. <laughs> um, is there a role uh, with past lives in the work that you do, um, epigenetics or ancestral stuff coming up and presenting in the now person? Like, how does that show up in the work that you do and what do you think about it? So I do have a little resistance to past lives. Um, I think it has to do with um, my dad having died this early and me still healing it, even though I have healed uh, most of it. There are still come up things, say when I watch movies and there's someone's parent dying, I still get really sad. So that goes probably tying into the past life. So I don't do a focus past life readings. Um, if someone asked me to do that, I would do it, but it doesn't come to me as the first thing. But what I do um, is bringing a picture, so um, it could be translated as programs from other past lives into this life. So, uh, and removing anything that hasn't worked and has stayed from a past life in this life in the person. To give you an example, so today uh, in this new year energy, um, I was working with the concept that we often think and have the program we call it from energy perspective, the picture, the healing needs to take time. And that's true. It used to do when, when our, the vibrations of the earth and the humans were lower, healing usually took a long time. But now we're getting to a point when things can happen so quickly, so amazingly. Uh, now, this from time perspective may be a little strange if I talk about the earth being vibrating a, a higher with time but then in energy there's no timeline this is really hard for us to understand as again the what we can't imagine we can't imagine um but what i did uh, in this work was remove the pictures that healing needs to take a long time and i brought pictures from a past life or past lives when healing happened quick so that's what i do with past lives I and I may do this with other kinds of pictures, such as programs of being the good wife, being the good girl, uh, having to not have breaks for myself. 
uh, remove those and I bring some others from other past lives. I may look at traumas, why they are repeating in their life uh, and then if they happen in past lives. I have a look at how many times partners have been together and if it had been the same kind of uh, similar vibration story. Um, it's kind of interesting and also we know that the work is uh, more profound to be done. Um, anything else I do there? I think that's, that's about the three main things um, I'll be looking at. You use the word pictures. And so is that part of your process? You see what's happening in the patterns inside of them as a picture and you remove the picture? Like, Correct. And you bring in a new picture that, where do you get the new picture from? Is this something that you create with the client? Where does that come from? The a new picture either comes from Akashic Records. Mm -hmm. Um, or, well, it would be uh, somewhere in the past life and brought into the Akashic Records at some point anyway. So in the teaching I follow, the Berkeley Cycling Institute lineage, uh, they go, the pictures from past lives are like files that go into the Akashic Records if they are supposed to be used again. And then we can recover them or we can file away what we have right here. And that is not beneficial. Amazing. So when you're doing the work, do you just request the picture and it comes or do you, or or does the picture just arrive? How does that happen? I'm very curious. Yeah, I request it to come. Um, I, well, let me see how I, because it's really funny. I was just, uh, today I work with coaches as well who, who get guidance for me. And I realize that sometimes as coaches or therapists, unless we talk about what we do, we don't really know how to describe what we do. Right. So this one I clearly haven't talked about yet. <laughs> <laughs> let me see. So I asked for the picture to, yeah, I first want to see where it was, what past life it was in. I have a look what it looks like. I asked if it was beneficial, if it's fully useful right now. And then I ask it to be installed where it's supposed to be installed instead of the one that we removed. While there is a healing done also on the resulting energy hole in the area that we removed the old picture from. Interesting. Okay, so... Uh, being a clairvoyant and also I channel, those are two different processes, although very related. And so when you're working with pictures, is this something that you're doing somewhat external to yourself or is this a channeled process that you are moving, a picture moves through you from the Akashic into the client or both? A great question. So this part, I don't, I don't channel. There is, uh, that comes apart from me. So the teaching I had followed so far included almost no channeling because in, in uh, the, the lineage, you do channeling only about after extra, it's about eight years of uh, your studies um, and work if they are linear. So I've been doing this now for, what is this, seven years. Uh, so I'm not trained, trained now basically to be channeling so much because that's what we are talking about at the beginning about uh, if I'm not used to enough being in the body yet, then I wouldn't be doing it from a healthy perspective. Uh, what I do kind of channel is uh, the energy that I heal with and I see in the body because I overlay uh, other people's energy onto my body. I make my body neutral and that way it's really near and dear to me <laughs> um, uh, from a neutral perspective that I can see and dig into it and uh, kind of rumble rummage with things uh, very easily but the pictures I, I don't really uh, do on me I just uh, ask my healing master my uh, main spirit guide to uh, bring it and uh, an Akashic record keeper of the particular person to uh, help me with that from the library thank you for allowing me to ask all these particular questions because I will tell you I know that my listeners want to know because when I say well I see this so we're like well how do you see it how do you hear that? What does it feel like when you see that? So they want to kind of know what the whole process is. So I, I do like to break it down for them. Um, thanks. So thank you. I, I would be the same. And yeah. I love people who are nerdy in that sense. Right. And then when you explain kind of how the process works, people can also say, well, wait a minute, that seems pretty familiar. I wonder if I've been doing that or if I can do that, or maybe that's part of my operating system. Um, let's talk a little bit about transmediumship. You did mention that at the beginning and mediumship is the ability to see well i mean people would say dead people but i mean also multi-dimensional beings as well how so do you see dead people do you talk to dead people do, when you're in sessions do dead people come on through yes um and again that's not a main part of my work right. um because man, the main part of my work is elevating you into high vibrations, making you aware that you are the energy being in a body and you have all this power here. <laughs> 
so so that's the you know and you can have loads of fun here and you can help the others to kind of awaken as well now it's part of that is uh your um late uh, father uh, who's going to help with that or some being then i do bring them in i let them pass messages um, and I may reintroduce them to you so that they can be with you uh, and you can communicate with them if you're ready for that. Um, and um, yes, so that, that's, that's the way I would be doing it. Now, this is not done uh, through the transmedium system I'm studying yet. That is still done through the former clairvoyant system. So they are a little different. What we do in the former clairvoyant system through uh, there's the same uh, lineage of Beatrix Aki Institute, uh, just not everybody gets the transmedium part. In the clairvoyant system, we stay in the body to be able to receive the message. In the transmedium studies, we leave the body, we actually run, it looks like unconscious energy. It's a really, really high vibrating white energy. We leave the body, we go above the body, we go looking at the body from kind of crown perspective, and that's where we are able to co connect to the spirit. So, which is more efficient, but you need to be more comfortable leaving the body right. and also back into the body. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay. What do you think about dreams? I think dreams are two things. Um, one of them is us on the astral uh, doing something. So us leaving the body as energy beings, leaving it here. Now, the beautiful thing you can do, uh, and again, um, I'm almost afraid most people don't do that. You can ask your healing team to do something with your body whilst it's lying there idle at night. So... <laughs> So I like to tell my team to go and you know, recover, you know, whatever needs to be recovered, uh, get me ready for whatever the next day is. I usually the more particular you are with the request, uh, the better it is. Um, and then I also like to assign what I'm going to be doing on the astral. So I go, okay, let me meet the people who are going to be listening to Crystal's podcast tomorrow. <laughs> That's what I was doing last night. Uh, then I'm doing another uh, Spanish thing on Sunday. So let me, you know, go, go and uh, get uh, those uh, maybe on a stage because there's uh, thousands <laughs> of those um, and get comfortable with me again. Um, so we go into the astral. Uh, we either do some fun stuff or less fun stuff there. Um, and the other thing that happens from the human perspective, we go processing emotions and processing chemicals in the body. Uh, that's what yeah, happens to us in dreams. I think dreams are also awakening to us knowing that there is way more beyond the body. Uh, but I would also say that we need to be wary of not uh, confusing or not kind of getting into the dream work too much so that we also enjoy the human world. Some people get into energy work too much and they don't enjoy their everyday life because it can feel kind of more fun to be in the dreams. Right, to be in the astral, to instead mm -hmm. of being anchored in the human reality. But that's why we came here. We came here to be embodied, right? Correct. And we yeah. came here to do that. Um, before we uh, began to record, you mentioned the role of integration in the work that you do. And I'd like you to expand upon this. Um, what, what, what is integration in terms of your healing work? So let me give an example of what integration is not. And unfortunately, that happens a lot in the energy world. Um, integration is not if you go having, say, ayahuasca and you don't get prepared for it um or maybe you get prepared for it only five days which is still better than nothing uh, but i do should be prepared for it two weeks three weeks ahead uh by uh, thinking about what your fears are from the process uh, changing your diet creating space creating the downtime which is a luxury to be honest then the process usually with most people I have seen is guided well and safely. And then after you need to have some kind of bounce off time about what happened, but not only the day after, two days after, you need to have it for two, three weeks after again. And the same goes with your diet. And then once you have realized what this experience has brought you, which of these healing medicines bring you kind of changing uh, the uh, nervous system, the wiring you have in your brain, and with that, basically the uh, dimension you are able to exist in, uh, the being the, I'm afraid of <laughs> being the next person, uh, being the 3D. So when you realize that, 
you need to come up with a guide that is with you, needs to come up with exercises every day. It could be as simple as remembering to use your intuition. It could be as simple as, uh, I saw I shouldn't eat pears during my vision, so now you ask her. And following with that, seeing how that feels in a month, two months or so, because otherwise you go back to your busy life and that vision, the experience, the gift basically you got gets stashed away under all the busyness that happens in your everyday life. And then maybe a year, five years later, you go, oh, I think I need to do ayahuasca again. But basically you never use the gift. Hmm. So what I do, that's why I don't do just reading sessions anymore. I do sessions that combine the reading, see what needs to be done to realize that you are the energy being in a body and to have your upper hand. And I come up with exercises as simple as I mentioned or more profound. I record them, I put them onto my teaching platform and tell the people to use them for as many days as my guides tell me. And then I also do the same in my courses. So that that's a difference there. And I've seen also in courses that you don't really have anything to do after the course what do you do after the course mm -hmm. so that you kind of juice the gifts use them interesting okay so you get the dispensation which is the gift but then you must have take some action steps you must continue like you must partner with the process right as it's moving co-create whatever the transformation is you can't just check out and just expect that it's going to be that it's going to be active the entire time so you're right. saying that you're adding in these integrative aspects that help you to optimize what's been given and utilize it. Correct. Yeah. And Got I it. do it always, if it's a personalized approach and uh, if it's not a course and even the course, I do have chat groups to kind of check on the people, but of course it's not as detailed. Um, I make sure I'm not overloading the person because with lots of people, you don't want to be adding things. You want to be changing things. You want to be uh, removing things, kind of streamlining things. I don't want to be giving them 10 more practices uh, in a day where they already have three kids and two dogs. Right. It's too much, <laughs> right? If it's too difficult, people will tend not to do it. So exactly. right, yeah. you, you want to do it in an embodied way, not just in a thinking way. Right. Well, this has been so fascinating. So you mentioned that you do session work and that you also have courses. Can we talk about what kind of courses you offer? Mm, sure. So I do courses that are called the energetic healing technique um, and you, they go in more levels. And in the first level, you start learning how to feel, run energy, how to feel and run energy, um, how to meet your main spirit guide and work with your spirit guide, how to manifest energy, how to protect yourself in energy. And as you go on, you learn to read energy, work with more protections, more tools and depending on where you are supposed to go, ready to go, you go there. Uh, during the courses, as I said, there is chat support with the group and with me, not only in the classes. So that's something, again, I hadn't seen in other courses and I like doing because I want to make sure you integrate <laughs> what you learn. Um, and then after the courses, I'm still running either reading clinics for the people who are already able to read energy um, or I'm running for everyone energy clearings uh, twice a month in English and once a month in Spanish as everything I do is in Spanish as well so that people stay in touch with energy and they keep working on their energy. And so I understand you have a, a class that's starting soon? Correct yeah I have a class that is starting on 28th of January mm -hmm. Is uh, four weeks always. Uh, one uh, one level is four weeks. Um, it is uh, two hours. Uh, you can either do it with us with us live, or you can do it from replay. Uh, let me think. Uh, what time it is? It is uh, uh, ten fifteen Pacific time. Ten fifteen a.m. Pacific time, um, and that is for me seven fifteen p.m. Central European time. Uh, now I, I do it uh, with uh, with respect to all the time zones uh, that I serve. Um, and the Spanish one is, is two hours later. And as I said, you can either do it with us live or if you skip one or two, it's completely okay to catch up from the replay. Uh, all the replays and exercises are uploaded just a few hours after on my teaching platform. And then if you feel like uh, digging in deeper, then you can just go on into the second level right after. And then I never know when I'm going to open the next one. And it's $250 for all the four classes, so for all your package of the cars. Wonderful. So where would somebody need to go to learn more about that and potentially register? 
Again, go on to linktree slash Jolly Solutions. And that is DJ, Ali, Together, and Solutions right after the slash. Okay, link in the description of this podcast. And also, if you're watching on YouTube, link in the description of this video. Well, this has been a fascinating conversation. Truly, thank you for sharing all of your um, expertise and your opinions on the world of spirit and the different gifts that you have and also that really everybody has. It's been a wonderful conversation. Thank you so much, Crystal. It's been such a pleasure talking to such an aware and trans person as oh well. Oh my gosh. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>